for five years and were the first to construct a solar home at Lakeside. In so doing, they launched the solar and environmental renaissance for this area that has led to Aji Peaks becoming the solar capital of Mexico. Dr. Aitken has contributed important renewable energy policy advances that have been adopted by 29 states in the U.S. and the European Union. He has received numerous awards for his renewable energy policy contributions and for his sustainable architecture designs. Today he's presenting his seventh annual update, Global Warming, Transitioning Mexico to Renewable Energy, and Ajiji, the solar capital of Mexico. Now, testing the volume, although Jim promises this is loud enough. I have two people who are hard of hearing said, please. And I believe we're okay. Are you all getting this pretty much in the back? All right, I want to thank very much the uh, people from Club Exotica for making this available. You'll see why it was so nice to make it available to be able to show a lot of uh, interesting pictures today. And thank Jim Spivey for doing an enormous amount of technical work to make the technical side of this work. And I uh, especially want to say, uh, uh, thank my, my good friend, Pia Aitken, who uh, gave us a wonderful meditation. And two weeks from today, this is an ad now, which you're not supposed to do, but two weeks from today, Pia will be the speaker for uh, Open Circle on the, on the topic, Why Organic? It'll be back at the usual venue back there. Not the ads. Okay. Um, I had said on, on the announcement for this, I was invited fortuitously recently to give two major addresses at conferences in Guadalajara and uh, Mexico City. And the one you have in front of me was my opening talk. I opened the conference in Guadalajara, which was on uh, energy saving, uh, uh, energy saving and energy, uh, sustainable energy for everyone. And uh, then just a couple of weeks after that, I'll show you the, well, here's how I started this one. And I, I go over and you're going to be seeing much of this on the available renewable energy that can really convert Mexico. And I talk about some of the technologies. And then I was invited down to Mexico City because of the uh, publicity that we're beginning to get now about IEE. And they had what amounted to an international solar cities conference. There were solutions for economically sustainable development was the, was the conference. And I was the closing speaker for that. So I thought, here, I put those two talks together. And, and I mean, why not just put them together and present them here? Well, a lot of things have happened just in the week since then. Hurricane Sandy has happened. The election has happened. And there's been a lot that I'd really like, that I've actually folded in here to make this more relevant. We are still going to be covering both of those other topics. So it's going to be about a full hour. The first half hour, I will be with global warming and climate change for US and for Mexico. And then the second half hour, I will go over the a plan for converting Mexico to 100% renewable energy, and then talk about IEE and what we've accomplished. <laughs> uh, the Earth is actually round. I noticed that when we plugged it in here, it became oblong on my computer. <laughs> and I think it's oblong there. Uh, oh, is, is it round? Good. My first I was afraid that when you did your meditation, you just pulled it over. <laughs> Okay, and beautiful Mexico. It's a lovely way. If you go back to this picture, you realize you are looking at Mexico. And that's the image that we want to keep in our minds of this beautiful place. We need this overhead light off now. Jim, are they going to do that? Jim Spivey? They're going to turn this overhead off and it'll leave some background light. There you are. Much better. So you have enough light also to be safe if you go to restaurants and things. Beautiful Mexico. What are we doing to our world? Well, to begin with, oh, let me just explain. Some of the slides do have words, and I will read the words that are on the slide so that you don't have to strain yourself to read them. If you want to, you get a second chance at, uh, at seeing them. Um, I don't do too many words, but there are three or four slides where I need to talk about certain actions and policies, and I will read those to you, which may be redundant if you're reading them, but make it easier for you. To begin with, we're putting a lot of stuff into the atmosphere that either doesn't belong there, 
or we are increasing stuff beyond the natural means, the natural amounts. And the stuff we're putting into the atmosphere adds to the natural atmospheric blanket that holds back some of the heat that would otherwise radiate out to space, thereby warming the Earth beyond the natural livable level we've enjoyed for the past 10,000 years. And I'll show a slide confirming that. And there are the, the primary greenhouse gases that are related to human activities, carbon dioxide, methane, CFCs, ozone, nitrous oxides. Is this a problem? Well, let's take a look. The atmosphere of carbon dioxide is increasing dramatically, increasing dramatically over what it used to be. It used to be what they call pre-industrial, 280 parts per million. We're just hitting 400 parts per million now. Where is that coming from? Well, we take a look this way, and the orange curve is the measured increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The blue curve is our calculation, and it's an easy one to do, of the amount of carbon dioxide that humans are putting into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. And it's pretty easy to see that the blue curve has become the driver of the total atmospheric carbon dioxide. So there's no question that the increase in carbon dioxide is coming from us, it is coming from fossil fuel burning. The largest increase in greenhouse gases then is carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. While we have other greenhouse gases, that's the main one that we talk about and work with. Um, temperature of the Earth is increasing. Uh, I show this bumpy one on purpose because there are all sorts of ones that kind of smooth the curves and everything, and it's bumpy. But there has been a definite increase to possibly a new pla plateau or a new increase, we don't know, um, since 1970 or so. And this year's temperature is going to be right on, there where it says 2011, 2012 will be right about there as well, a little bit higher. And so there's been a temperature increase to the Earth in response to the greater amount of energy that's being trapped from the greenhouse gases. Now, if you heat the, the lower atmosphere, you're also heating the oceans. And so the ocean energy content is now measured with thousands, over 4,000 measuring stations scattered on the surface of the ocean everywhere uh, to demonstrate that ocean temperatures are rising as well. Now, this is a very important slide. This is done by um, one of the senior uh, scientists at uh, NASA. And it shows, it's a logarithmic chart, so it shows the temperature of the surface of the Earth. The left-hand side, where it starts, was the last ice age. And you see us coming out of the ice age 10,000 years ago. And then you see from 10,000 years ago until now, there are some blips. And when they blitz down, we have a little ice age, but you notice you don't go very far. When the blip was up, the Vikings could land in Greenland because there was some melting. But you'll notice that overall, um, it's been surprisingly constant. And he calls this the historic sweet pot that covered the entire 10,000 years of the development of human civilizations and human societies. He believes that we've been very, very lucky that we've had that basic stability while we've had all these last 10,000 years of development. And on the right-hand side, you can see what people are worrying about. There's a little bit of a blip that's gone up now. We're not outside that range yet. But if you look at the two to three degrees centigrade, expectation, probably inevitable now, as a lower bound to what's going to happen, um, you will realize that we are moving ourselves out of the sweet spot. And we're moving ourselves out of the sweet spot by our own actions. That's a big step for human civilizations and societies to take. Now, people try to look for other reasons. We really do. As scientists, we want to find what are the real reasons. It, it can't just be putting uh, greenhouse gases in there. There are natural cycles, and there are. The Earth's orbit precesses. The whole orbit around the galaxy center precesses. And that gives us ice ages for every 40,000 years, and every 100,000 years we get major changes, but not these rapid changes. There's, there's no accounting by anything that the Earth is doing that can account for the rapid changes. So we look at the sun, and indeed, the amount of sun's energy as it goes through the sunspot cycles varies. And here you can see it through major, three major sun spot cycles and coming into a fourth. And the amount of energy varies by about a quarter of a watt of energy per square meter from when we have the sunset, the sun cycle maximum to the sunspot cycle minimum. And that, as the comment here says, that accounts for at most half of the Earth's energy imbalance 
and more recently, they've demonstrated that at most, the variations in the sun count for about a quarter of the Earth's temperature imbalance. So the other three quarters is still coming from something else. <clears throat> is it just coincidence that the Earth and its oceans are warming at the same time that we're increasing the human added greenhouse gases? According to detailed atmospheric models, it's not. They show that the increase in greenhouse gases will produce higher Earth's surface temperatures. But to some, this is not convincing evidence. So what else do we see? Well, rather interesting things are happening. The U.S. summer in March, they call it summer in March heat wave, described by meteorologists as the most statistically, keep that in mind, statistically freakish weather event in the continent's history. Heat wave boils 100 million people, 1,000 temperature records broken. The president had to declare 1,000 U.S. counties as disaster areas eligible for federal assistance because of the excessive heat. We have heat waves. But what you're going to begin to see is each thing of these things that I show you are not just the normal. They're record-setting. And we begin to wonder how many record-setting things can we have at once before it's beginning to tell us something. 29 states, shaded in red, had their record warmest January through May 2012. <clears throat> this is the temperature of the United States, uh, average yearly temperature bouncing all around. Um, but look at 2012. So something really quite different has happened this year. I don't expect it necessarily to happen next year. There are statistics. It will go up and down. But boy, is the up becoming a major up now. And that's causing serious problems. Farmers, people buy food, which is like most of us. The current disaster, the national drought conditions, 52% of the U.S. was in moderate drought. 20% of the U.S. was in extreme or exceptional drought. <coughs> Excuse me. Forests are dying out and burning. 2012 brought all-time record forest fires in Arizona and New Mexico. There's that word again. Rainstorms are now turning into flooding rains in the U.S. and Mexico. The Arctic and Antarctic and Greenland are all melting. The interesting thing happened this summer. The surface of Greenland, the entire surface of Greenland, melted all at once. That's the first time it's been seen to do it all at once during the summer period. That's what the red color is. Okay. The Arctic region is warming five times faster than the rest of the world, leading to accelerated ice melt. Arctic summer sea ice comparing 79, 2003, and 2012. Now look at the differences. As the sea ice each summer gets less and less, and so only 29% now of the Arctic Ocean is covered with ice this summer. And as a result, they expect now, they used to say it could be ice free in 100 years, and they said it could be ice free in 50 years. <clears throat> now they think there's an excellent chance it'll be ice free in 10 years. Things are happening much faster even than the theoreticians expected. Does all of this prove the existence of human-caused global warming and climate change? No. Each of these events could have just happened. Even though they're records, they could have just happened. But since each event is a record event, the natural occurrence for each is with a very low probability. That is, each event would be a very rare one. That's why they're record events. For all of the rare events that are now happening to happen at the same time, requires the multiplication of the unlikely probabilities of each individual event. You flip a coin, the chances are one out of two, you get heads. Flip a coin twice, chances are one out of four, you'll get two heads both times. Flip it three times, chances are one out of eight, you'll get three times. Okay, you've got record event, record event, record event. Will they all happen once you multiply the probabilities together? And furthermore, find other things that we, we can't really see. Scientists can't discover any geophysical or external astronomical possible causes for the Earth's warming. So the result is a vanishingly small probability <coughs> sorry, that all that is happening simultaneously could be by chance or coincidence. Each single event could have happened by chance. But a vanishingly small probability that all these record setting events, floods, and everything could be happening simultaneously. This extremely unlikely simultaneous occurrence of global warming and climate extreme changes and consistency with computer simulated models that actually track it quite accurately is the strongest evidence we have to date of the reality of the human cause, global warming, and climate change. 
Well, is this then proof of the reality of human caused global warming and climate change? Again, no. But the potential for error in making this statement is now getting vanishingly small. And be aware, I'm a physicist. Physics doesn't prove things. It's as close as a proof as physics can usually get to proving anything. We, we, we announce results, experimental results, in terms of probability, in terms of sigmas. This great discovery they had recently of the, of the new particle. They, they went up to what they call five sigmas, one chance in 10,000 that you'll be wrong, and then you can announce it. That's how we do in physics. So basically, we're to the point where several sigma out in saying that we're right. And yet there's always this small chance that we're wrong. So for people who say we're not proving it, okay, hasn't proven it. But those who persist in denying this near-proven reality have neither well-established atmospheric science, nor statistical mathematics, nor observed reality on that side. They have an uphill argument to prove their case. And so, to our kind senator from Oklahoma, human-induced climate change is not a hoax, and it is, unfortunately, our future and I should have put another note, our future is now here. Well, ask the polar bears. Okay? Things are getting dicey up there. <laughs> now we know we're in trouble. But at least the bears are smart enough to know where part of the solution will come from. <clears throat> okay. What effect might the melting Arctic ice have on climate in the Canada and the US? For a possible answer to that, let us now spend a while looking at Hurricane Sandy. It left this terrible trail of, of destruction, maybe $50 billion worth of damage. That was 18 days ago. Here it comes. Here it is. It was quite an experience. To ruin your whole day. <laughs> yeah. It was not funny, really, for the people who lived in New York City. It was really quite quite tragic and difficult, and, and the fire departments couldn't get there. So fires burned uncontrolled in the Queens section of New York City. 90 houses were burned down. They announced just yesterday now they're going to have to actually tear down several thousand houses from along the coast and the burned houses as a result. Each one of those is a tragedy for the people who live, live in them. But the greatest damage is inflicted by the storm surge. So the storm literally blows the surface of the water, which raises the level. That's a storm surge. And it came, unfortunately, on top of a high tide. It was just bad timing. And so the combination of the two gave a 15 to 17 foot surge that went in. So here it comes. And it was quite an experience for the New Yorkers. Streets, Manhattan. This is what Manhattan looks like, lower Manhattan. Financial district of New York, the financial center of the world. That's what it looked like. Financial district, the parking garage, the cars all floated out. Interior of Staten Island building, that had a lot of trouble in Staten Island, as you can imagine. Verizon's corporate headquarters in Manhattan, when they put the corporate headquarters there, I'm sure they felt safe. There they are. When people took subways, I'm sure they felt safe. There's the 86th Street subway station. I'm showing this because what, what's in the news isn't as impressive as what you actually see. You can really get a feeling now for the enormity of the event that they all went through. You could try to drive out of the way of the storm and not move for hours and really get pissed off at each other in the process. Fist fights. So you move your truck, you move this, that. We do very badly with traffic whenever there's an emergency. Electricity out in gas stations didn't help the same situation. Even bringing your own, own uh, cans to the station didn't help. Electricity was out, pumps didn't work. Didn't help to call a cab. <laughs> Hoping that a bus, any bus, might still be running. And what you do when the transit systems are down, you walk. Look at New York City, walking to work, walking around. Well, the eight costliest hurricanes in US history, and these are in constant $2,008 now, seven have happened in the last eight years, between 2004 and 2012. 
seems to be some kind of cost trend, if not strength trend. Hurricane Katrina is still number one, but Sandy has moved all the way up to number two. We're going to look at these because there's something very interesting looking at the differences between these hurricanes. Here's Hurricane Katrina, the costliest in US history. And there was its path, came across southern tip of Florida, went in the Gulf, and then went, made a straight shot through New Orleans and on up. Nice sweeping curve. Hurricane Sandy is the second costliest hurricane. It was the largest hurricane ever recorded in size, went all the way up to Michigan when it was hitting the coast. Barometric pressure of its eye, the lowest ever recorded. Some more records. Hurricane Sandy is weird, and we're going to come back to that weirdness. Hurricane Ike, the third costliest hurricane in U.S. history, making landfall in Texas. Nice long sweeping arc, and then turned into the coast, and then, then came up. Hurricane Wilma, 2005, the fourth costliest hurricane, and yet it just crossed the southern tip of Florida, but it was close enough, went up along the coast, and managed to trash a lot of the coast on the way up. Hurricane Irene was the eighth, and I like to show it, because it, it then comes up nice and smoothly. It's very similar to the path of Hurricane Sandy, very similar, except it just smoothly went on up. And Hurricane Donna, which is a while ago, but the same thing, generally when the hurricanes come along the coast, they go smoothly on up. There's no forces that cause them to change. And not to leave you Canadians out of this, thank you, Tony Wilshire. <laughs> Hurricane Hazel, a long time ago, but this, this is amazing. It went across land all the way to Toronto. It merged with the cold front on the way, so as hurricanes lose energy as they go across land, it was able to pick up extra energy to warm the cold and made it all the way up to Toronto where it killed 80 people and caused hundreds of millions of dollars of damage and flooding and wind damage. Who in Toronto would have thought you'd have a hurricane? There you are again, it hit the coast and went straight up. Okay, we compare the most intense hurricane paths. Take a look at those. Big sweeping arcs, pretty much long straight lines until you hit Sandy. Sandy's path is unique. It is unlike any path recorded for the hurricanes that have come in. It took a hook to the left. Unlike all of the other hurricanes, <coughs> excuse me, oh, that's bad. I do like this. Which had smooth paths or great slow sweeping turns. If Sandy had continued on its path, look at the lower part there. If it had continued like the other hurricanes normally do, it would have missed the US. It would have trashed the coast some, but it wouldn't have done a direct hit. The huge damage was caused because of that abrupt change in path. Why did the path change? Well, we look at this and we see something interesting. As Sandy comes in, there's something coming toward it on the left side. And now they collide. That something coming toward it is the other storm. And they kept talking about the, the Franken storm, where two storms are going to collide. And there they are, colliding as it comes in, warm and cold. And here's where it came from. The jet stream did something that is extremely unusual for it. They have noticed that as the Ice, uh, summer ice in the Arctic Ocean is becoming less. The jet stream in general has been moving south. And it always has some hooks and wrinkles and things, but not like this. It got that, it got that huge hook that went down, came back up, set up a situation that caused the two storms to be created and caused the one to be sucked into the coast. And they believe now that it came from the alteration of the air currents over the warming Arctic Ocean. That is, the publication is now coming out scientifically. So there it's being pushed in, and that caused the Frankenstorm, a double push. And so it does appear that the effects of global warming in the Arctic may have helped to reduce the Frankenstorm impact on New York City and New Jersey. I say that because everybody is coming around saying, look, it's just another hurricane. The, the uh, global warming has nothing to do with it. Well, that basically is true just another hurricane. Until it got close to the coast, till the jet stream changed, till all of these other things came in and made it into a monster. So I like to show this because it suggests that the impacts of global warming way far away from where we live can have serious consequences right where we live. And then what happened just two days after that in New York City, as if they didn't have enough from that storm? The, the, the hurricane went on up, the rest of the cold front came through, and that's what they had a few days later. All right. 
Now, the International Energy Agency World Energy Forecast for 2035, when it came out six days ago, the brand new study, quoting, taking all new developments and policies into account, the world is still failing to put the global energy system onto a more sustainable path, the agency said. This is highlighted by a 30% increase in fossil fuel subsidies to $523 billion in 2011. I put this up because every now and then after I give my talk, I get at least two angry emails. And one angry email came in last year, and I, you might remember last year I talked some about fossil fuel subsidies, which were in the range of $450 billion last year. And the person said, fossil fuels do not get any subsidies. So I just thought you'd like to see the latest IEA numbers for what they don't get. <laughs> and the chief economist said the world's going in the wrong direction on climate change, which just slipped off the policy radar. Did it? Sure did. Here's what the presidential candidates had to say about global warming and climate change during the campaign. That's it. That's global warming for you folks. Next subject. Okay. I like this cartoon also. One thing we forgot to mention, climate change. Oh, yeah. Okay. President Obama and New Jersey Governor Christie in a shelter. Is that true? New Jersey was really trash. Before the hurricane disaster of New Jersey, uh, Governor Christie, as a Republican, had actively campaigned for Romney and had nothing good to say about President Obama. He was even the keynote speaker at the Republican National Convention, and he trashed President Obama in that keynote speech. But after Hurricane Sandy went through, and Obama went down, and FEMA began helping out. Governor Christie had great praise for the president and for the value of government in helping out in natural disasters. He said he had learned quite a lesson, which totally ticked off the Republicans at that state one week before the election. But it's quite interesting how an event can change your opinion, especially if you're in it. Immediately after the election, Obama said this. Many of you may have heard this. We want our children to live in an America that isn't threatened by the destructive power of a warming planet. <clears throat> Here's the uh, mayor of Bloomberg surveying the burned out area of New York City, and after that he made this comment. He said, our climate is changing, and while the increase in extreme weather we have experienced in New York City and around the world may or may not be the result of it, <clears throat> the risk that it may, there comes a really important world word. <clears throat> The risk that it may, given the devastation it is wreaking, should be enough to compel all elected leaders to take immediate action. Now here comes the argument. But this is at the heart of the argument, should we or should we not. So let's talk about the argument just for a moment. Should we, as Mayor Bloomberg urged, let the risk of enormous and increasing damage and costs from climate change cause governments to take actions now, even though we can't know for sure how big the risk is, and we wonder if we really should spend all that money. Or will it cost to reduce our carbon emissions against an unknown risk in the future, divert monies, which could otherwise be used today to meet important social needs? Is the unknown risk worth this impact on today's economic world? That is the argument that's raging in Congress that rages everywhere. It's an impossible question to answer. It's a judgment call, as we make judgments regarding how much we risk to expose ourselves with investment portfolios. You're not going to put everything into speculative stocks. Too risky. On the other hand, you want to put some speculative stocks because maybe they'll do well, right? Ah, you're making risk judgments all the time. Or when we ingest uh, non-organic foods, as we'll hear about in a couple of weeks. We make risk judgments every day. We enjoy the benefits for now, and we hope the worst won't come. You get on an airplane. Oh, that is a very small risk, which it is, actually. The trouble is, with climate change, we enjoy the benefits, but the worst will come to our children and grandchildren. This makes it different from all of the other risks, and that's what we have to understand when we do this argument. It is a serious ethical and moral decision. It's not just economics today versus economics in the future. What in today's dollar is their future worth to us, okay? You can't, you can't equate it the same way that we have before. And the people who just keep arguing, no, 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 we shouldn't spend the money today. Whoa. Think, folks. Take a look at where you're laying that risk. What could we do about it? Nice picture here. What could you do about it? That alone should be sufficient to sway the world's governmental decision makers to seek to minimize that risk by investing in solutions today. And now here's the special thing. Especially when the solutions 
are for energy efficiency and renewable energy. They create new industries, millions of jobs, save billions of dollars through efficiency improvements, and probably are a net profit. So taking the financial steps now to reduce that risk um, is probably economically a very good thing to do. We will come to Mexico very shortly and see that President Calderon has taken that step. What kinds of actions should we take? We'll take another lesson from Hurricane Sandy after that. The day after his election, Obama stated that his administration had not done enough to combat global warming. He said that. He said he hopes to begin his second term by opening a national conversation on climate change. We'll see what actually comes out of this. Well, something else that went out, something else we learned that's going to really be out of the second part of this talk. They didn't have power in New York City because the power stations were underground, underwater. But they had one of the largest solar systems in the United States, in New Jersey, 32 million watts. It got through Hurricane Sandy just fine. It started producing power again as soon as the sun came up, while the conventional power plants in the cities were still underwater and shut down. Similarly, there are wind farms in New Jersey and in New York State. They were in the hurricane's path. They got the hurricane standing just fine, just feathered the propellers until the blades, until the strong winds went by, turned them back, cranked out power. Conventional power stations down, wind and solar delivery. Three of the area nuclear power plants had to be shut down for safety. Five nuclear power plants in the storm's path had problems. An alert was issued for the Oyster Creek plant in New Jersey. That's the one in the photograph here. This is a practical demonstration that renewable energy systems have great security benefits during and after major natural disasters. And that has to start figuring in the economic equation. <coughs> International Agen Inter Agency Energy Agency World Forecast again. World nuclear capacity. They expected the nuclear industry is taking a realistic look at changing attitudes in various governments worldwide. And they said, and this is put out by the world into the nuclear industry, you'll see from my source, that they expect the share of nuclear power in total generation by 2035 to fall from 13% to 12%. Last year, second source of an angry email to me, I, I presented to all of you that if we gave the nuclear industry everything they wanted, go ahead, take everything you want, make them as fast as you can, they could never create more than 25% of the electrical demand of the world by 2050. It was physically, economically impossible. Well, the nuclear industry is much more conservative than I was last year. They're saying they can only produce that much. That said, I said last year, that means that we've got to find the other 75% from something else. And the nuclear industry is now saying we have to find actually another 88 or 87% from something else. Renewables are set to become the world's second largest source of power generation by 2015 and close in on coal as the primary source by 2035. Renewables share of electricity generation will grow from 20% to 31% by 2035 and nuclear will be 13% to 12%. So you begin to see, for people who still say that, ah, you know, renewable solar, wind, that's just, it's not real stuff. It's not only the real stuff, it's the dominant stuff. And it's extremely exciting time to be in right now. Well, let's bring all this discussion to Mexico. Mexico is particularly hard hit by the impacts of global warming. Hurricanes, floods, drought. Here are some important images of the su uh, suffering that global warming is bringing. This, I show this one, a lot of works here, but it's the first time in history that two hurricanes from two oceans have made landfall at the same time. One was category two up north, the other one was category four down south, and they both hit Mexico at the same time. Very rare event. Hurricane Alex, June 2000. 10. Floods after Hurricane Allen. It was rough. <clears throat> Hurricane Frank just skimmed Mexico. Didn't hit it, but oh my. The flooding rains, we all read about those down south. Hurricane Bud this year. Hurricane Carlotta just a couple months ago, three months ago.
Hurricane Ernesto, also this year. And then what's really the big for Mexico is the extraordinary drought. The calculations have been made that if carbon dioxide doubles in the atmosphere, droughts will be a big of reality. And you can calculate from that agricultural production. And you'll see, let's see, I'll try this one, Jim. OK. Right here is Mexico. And you'll see that Mexico and only one other place are expected to be the hardest hit for reduction in grain yield because of drought conditions. Hardest hit. It will be bad. What is that already? The North American Drought Monitor is showing a lot that's going on, and it's especially down here. And it's very, very serious. The droughts affecting northern Mexico, there are five northern states in Mexico have seen their worst drought in 70 years. There's another statistic. OK, we had a drought 70 years ago, too. People can say that. That's true. But we're having it again now in juxtaposition with a lot of other things. See why I wanted to show pictures today? They really tell stories that just words don't tell. A caravan of peasants traveled to Mexico City to ask the government for aid. Conclusion, global warming and climate change are affecting Mexico in a very large way. It shows that Mexico must begin to use energy resources that don't produce CO2. Well, President Calderon of Mexico responded to this risk to the Mexican people more aggressively then did President Obama respond to the American people. Here is the Mexico General Law on Climate Change Act passed on April 19 of this year and is supported on a cross-party basis. Political parties, both sides, all supported this. The act includes a mandate in Mexico to reduce Mexico's carbon dioxide emissions by 30% by 2020 and 50% by 2050. The act also states that 35% of Mexico's electricity should come from renewable energy sources by 2024. A very, very aggressive act. Mexico and the United Kingdom are the only two countries in the world to have passed climate change legislation. Good for Mexico. Well, let's take a look at the extraordinary renewable energy resource base that can power this transition for Mexico. Where can Mexico look for energy to replace the fossil fuels? This is a kind of a fun one with the sun. All of the energy of the coal, oil, and gas known to humans everywhere has the same energy the sun gives us in 20 days. We see these. Extraordinary resource. Extraordinary potential resource benefit. The potential of Mexico for making electricity from solar energy is enormous many, many times larger than the potential for all other energy sources. And unlike the other sources, solar energy is available everywhere in Mexico. This is a solar resource chart. The areas that are in orange and dark orange and light orange and yellow are among the strongest solar energy resources in the world. We have the third greatest solar resources of any country in the world. Well, how much would you have to cover? Suppose you wanted to capture that solar energy, and you want to make electricity to the whole country. We're not going to do it the way I show this picture. I'll show it how we should do it. But see that little box right there? That little box is the amount that we need, 65 kilometers, 40 miles on the side, would, and if we capture that solar energy with an efficiency of about 10%, 15%, would produce enough electricity to equal all the electricity the whole country uses. It's quite a resource. A lot of different technologies, concentrating photovoltaic, dish sterling, tower, trough, Basically, for utility scales, you put lots of these together, like the concentrating photovoltaics, the dish sterling dishes, or the power towers, where you're reflecting it up to the top of the tower, making a hot fluid, flashing that fluid to steam, and driving a steam turbine. And uh, in the US, there are already uh, the very giant systems being developed now for central receivers. The most famous one, the one that's been used the most, and that was really invented in Israel and brought to this country, called the parabolic trough, where you reflect onto that shiny pipe. And there's a fluid, sorry. There's a fluid going through that shiny pipe that gets very hot, 800 degrees centigrade. And then you send it into water, flashes of steam, and you run a turbine. So rather recently, we did a, another big one in the United States. 
But the easiest and the simplest to use of all are photovoltaic panels. You put them down and they just sit there. The sun hits them and the electricity comes out the back side. I mean, they're, they're really remarkable, remarkable devices. They will dominate the world's electricity production for this century is over. And I'm showing you pictures of installations in Mexico. There are a few, the Grupo Desmex, which is in Leon and also in Guadalajara, has done some rather good size systems here in Mexico. Some big rooftop systems. Sands Club, a couple hundred kilowatts, quite big. Okay, well PV parking lots, be wonderful. We got parking lots all over Mexico. The nice thing about photovoltaic parking lots is you shade the cars. The land is free, it's already there. It's a really great idea. So it's going gangbusters in the United States, putting PV in parking lots. All right. The largest PV system in Jalisco is a 50 kilowatt carport in Guadalajara done by E2 Energias. Guillermo is here in front represented them. So they started that too. You can put lots and lots of photovoltaics together and make huge farms. Six megawatt PV power in an entire German village. There's the 32 megawatt system that was in New Jersey and still is. I didn't mind the hurricane. This was Rancho Seco nuclear power plant in Sacramento. They shut it down. It was just they just kept throwing money at it. Whole, make it work, finally gave up. Said, let's use the land for something productive as long as we got the land. That's what they did. Well, actually, what people are doing now more and more is putting large fields of solar right next to conventional power plants. Because when the sun shines, you can back down on the power, especially with the gas fire plant. It's easy. You can back down on the power and, and use that solar energy. When the sun doesn't shine, then you come up with the power again. And we have a remarkable 27 year old example of it in the United States, the world's largest solar power plant. 350 more four megawatts, about one third the size of a nuclear power plant. Been running for 27 years, and in essence, there's the gas-fired power plant in the middle, and the solar all around it. And they have a guarantee that from seven in the morning till seven at night, Southern California Edison will receive exactly the same amount of power every day, regardless of weather. All right, well you say, what happens when the sun doesn't shine? Well, you use the gas. But how much will you get when the sun doesn't shine? 75%. So for 27 years, they saved 75% of the gas because they had the solar field. So you begin to find a remarkable marriage that's going to help enormously in our transition from fossil fuels. And that is to begin to mix and play with them together so that you can use the fossil fuel to stabilize the intermittent renewable. Well, enormous potential for wind. My goodness, the power of that atmosphere. And we have the world's greatest wind energy potential, the world's greatest in Oaxaca. Why? Because we've got two oceans, and they're different temperatures, and we've got fairly flat land in between, and the wind just whistles between the two. So the Mexico wind map at 80 meters shows the, the darkest areas are the ones that show a lot of wind potential. <laughs> and in the same picture, the black areas are where you really have the potential for wind. I'm showing this because I'm going to come back when I show the plan for Mexico. So you'll see that there are dark areas on the shore, Veracruz, Yucatan area, also Zacatecas inland, also on Baja area. They're scattered around Mexico, major wind areas. So we don't have to just develop in Oaxaca and run transmission lines everywhere. The potential is making for Mexico is very, very large. And I'll show you a few that you've got already in Oaxaca. So they have started. They have a long way to go. But they're getting some very good experience. What else do we have in Mexico? Geothermal energy, steam. And we got San Juan Cosola here. Right? It's not hot enough steam in order to drive turbines. So by God, it's hot enough for wonderful pools and baths and things. It all comes from uh, Mount Garcia, what Mount Garcia did for us a long time ago. Geothermal electricity, you just take the steam, spin a turbine, and you're done. So they did the first geothermal plant in Mexico in 1958. And the geothermal resources for Mexico are also scattered all over, just like the wind resources. And remember, the solar resources is everywhere. Ah, beginning to find the ingredients for a plant. But the bright yellow area is the high level. And notice the bright yellow area concentrated in Jalisco. We live in a magic area down here for multiple resources. The ones in production are red, 
The green ones are the new plants they're putting up, and all the spotted yellow ones are where they could have geothermal plants. Okay? A few pictures of what they've got here. Hydroelectric power, another one. 22% of the electricity produced in Mexico is produced by hydro. The largest hydroelectric plants are on various rivers. You can see them listed below. Tico Sen, the uh, largest hydroelectric power generator in Mexico. The 50th anniversary of the Mexican Revolution was celebrated with a hydroelectricity stamp. And we're now celebrating the 105th anniversary as of tomorrow. And this came out eight days ago. Eight days ago, President Calderon inaugurated the world's second biggest dam for hydroelectric power and for agricultural water. This time, they were very careful, and they did not have to displace villages. They did not have to displace people. They're beginning to learn their lessons on that, because there's been a lot of personal human tragedies behind building the big uh, reservoirs in the past. That's the new one. Can renewable energy realistically provide for almost all of the power needs of an entire country? I mean, realistically. Can you pull these things together? I'm going to take a look at combining solar and wind first, because that's what we do in California, and I'll show you why. Now, just, I'm just going to show a chart for a little bit here, and I'll show it step by step. The daily electrical load curve for California is the dark blue one at the top. That shows the need. We get more need during the day and less need during the night. The green one is the amount of wind power. And when we get wind power in California, we tend to get more wind at night than the daytime. Big deal. It doesn't help as much in the daytime. The orange curve is when we get our solar energy in California in the daytime, not at nighttime. But look what happens if you put the orange and yellow curves together. Look at the light blue curve. And all of a sudden, you find by feeding wind and solar simultaneously into the same grid, you've got 90% of your actual load demand. Well, this is even more remarkable because this is Germany's plan for 100% energy, for renewable energy. Germany, with solar energy equivalent to southern Canada and Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Germany, the world's leader in applying solar energy. More solar energy applied in Germany and buildings than anywhere else in the world. Germany, because of government policy. They say, OK, start on the left with solar and wind. Into that, see that bumping? You feed them into the grid. Okay? You look at the bumps after you've put both of them together. And then you fill in the bumps, with Germany's case, with biogas, where they burn and then make electricity, and hydroelectric. And they come out the right-hand side with the actual load curve of Germany for 24 hours. So we do it for Mexico. And the only difference I've made in this is put geothermal down where they have biogas. Take the intermittency of solar and wind, put them together. We're already at maybe 75% of what we need. We fill in geothermal. You can really rank, crank up the power up and down quickly. Natural gas, you can do that. Back up the reservoirs, you can do that. There is the basis for 100% renewable energy conversion for Mexico. But it requires a complete change of the whole transmission network, right? You can feed all of these things in. So if we start out with a wind resource, we start out with a solar resource, we start out with the, with the um, geothermal resource, and then we do this. This is the plan that I brought to Mexico City, and this is basically what I've been carrying around the state. We establish six zones in Mexico. We center each zone around the major wind power that we have in those zones. We also know that we have major re uh, solar resources in all six of those zones. So what we do is we feed the wind and solar together within that circular zone, and then we add what we've got. You've got geothermal, we add it. You've got hydro, we add it. We use those to levelize and stabilize. And what do we have? We have six almost independent zones being powered by renewable energy in Mexico. Then we connect those zones, and the reason we do that is we have to be aware that we've got areas in the zones, the blue one, for example, with very sparse population, and the middle zones where we've got Guadalajara and Mexico City, where we've got lots of people. So we're going to have to be able to bring power in from the other zones to supplement where the people actually live. But we can do that because it becomes more realistic distance for the transmission lines than it would be if you just went up from Oaxaca, for example. 
So each zone can operate as an independent, self-sufficient region. Connecting them provides the assurance of 100% reliable power for the entire country for all time. This is real stuff, folks. It's a real opportunity for Mexico. Take a look at Europe. Europe is planning, ultimately, to have a grid interconnection between North Africa, all of Europe, all of Scandinavia, and even uh, the United Kingdom, where you can see the colored yellow resources, the solar resources for North Africa come up and mixed with the blue, the wind offshore resources for Europe and the other resources. And they're planning this major interconnect. And Europe, the European Union, feels that when they have this kind of interconnect in the future, all of Europe would be 100% powered by renewable energy. These are not toys, this is real stuff. Shows Mexico could get 90 to 100% of its electrical energy needs from wind and solar, supplemented and stabilized by geothermal and hydroelectric, and with no more than a few percent at most of natural gas backup. Go ahead, use natural gas to help fill in. It's all right, just don't use much. Okay. Mexico's transition started in one community here. And our village demonstrates that starting with one solar system can lead to a solar energy transition of an entire year. So let's come home. Here, we're coming back down now with our meditation. <laughs> back we are. It's time for a rooftop revolution. There's a book that came out that day. I like that. Here's the story. Well, when I was meditating just now, I took my camera with me. And so I, I, I thought I'd put one of the pictures I took while I was meditating just to let you know I was, I was doing it too. So here we come down to our villages. And there's something remarkable about our villages. The topography and the lake views, all of the lakeshore houses face south. It is the perfect direction for receiving and controlling solar energy for winter warmth and summer shading. <clears throat> so we'll start with our house and talk about what we did with that. Lovely Hacienda style house. We bought it because Hacienda style is the natural environmental design for Mexico. You have a south facing courtyard, it warms up, it makes a micro microclimate. The heat, you open up the doors and windows, the heat goes into the house, and we're warm all winter. Don't need to roll heaters around, that's nice. That was the beginning. Then we tore a wall down between our house and the vacant field below us, and we built, according to US design standards, Rick Collishaw has been writing some wonderful articles, actually, and Opo did a lot of it, I guess, right? Um, on passive techniques, and we, we use those techniques, we'll look at it. And we converted this into our office, and ultimately it will be a casita for someone to live in when we'd like to have live in ill. I hope 50 years from now or so. <laughs> and then we had that roof space, so we put solar electric on it. And so it became the first grid-connected PV system in the Ahi Chapa zone. And Jason Mills and Isan Energy rightfully laid claim to that because Jason came down from uh, San Miguel de Allende with the other people in order to do our house. And after they did our house, began to find opportunities to stay and, and do uh, other jobs. These nine panels on that roof are sufficient to provide 88% of the electricity needed by both houses. It reduces our electricity by 92%. That's all it takes. So for those of you who don't have solar, you want to see how much you need. It, you don't really dedicate a whole lot of your house roof to it. We pay 50 pesos every two months for our electricity bill. We save 18,000 to 20,000 pesos every year in comparison with our neighbors. Minus one, we have a neighbor next to us now at solar. <laughs> then, oh, Jim, I touched this. I think it's, it, it's still okay. okay. We have solar water heating, which is really valuable. Heating our water with solar energy allows us to get over one year from one 300 liter tank of propane, saving us about 7,500 pesos each year compared with our neighbors. It's, it's no brainer to heat your pools with solar. It's a no brainer to heat economic to heat your um, water with solar. And we'll show you it's become pretty much a no brainer to make your electricity. So one of the passive principles of this little house, deep east side overhang for morning low sun protection. West side, fully protected from the hot, glaring afternoon sun and painted white to help keep us cool in the afternoon. Okay. A south-facing overhang, sized for winter passive solar heating and summer cooling shading. 
So March 21, September 21, there's the shadow. The yellow line marks the shadow from that little short overhang. December 21, the sun is much lower. The shadow has moved up. The sun comes flying in, penetrates inside, and keeps us cozy and warm. So in the morning when the temperature is in the 50 to low 60s, I go into my office and the temperature is 72, and it's just really nice to work there. In summer, all windows are fully shaded and open for natural cooling ventilation. So that little overhang controls the shadows, controls the solar in our windows, gives it to me when I want it, and keeps us from out when we don't want it. The proper shading angle, I'm just going to show you one little technical thing. There it is, 70 degrees, if you want to know what that shading angle is, you measure from the bottom of the window to be shaded, up to the thing that creates the shade, and measure 70 degrees, and you get what we did. We get winter penetration in summer. Uh, shade, about 90 degrees minus our latitude. When we're finished, we created the first office in the Chapala Lakeside area, designed for passive solar heating and cooling. The first house and office was solar electric energy for all electricity and water heating. And then people began coming to our house, and we began, this is my seventh annual now, right? Began giving these talks. A couple pictures of it, and of course we have our organic garden. <clears throat> all right, number of solar houses in the IE Lakeside area, 2007-1. I think I'm right. I moved this in such a way that it's... Is it all right? It sounds to me like it's making a pop when I... Okay. 2007, one house. What do you do for winter solar warmth if you have a deep shading overhang facing south as everybody does? Everybody has a big overhang, because who wants just a little overhang? Where you can't sit in the shade. You can't barbecue up there and all that. You know, we all have these big ones over our, our, our areas. Well, Alan and Kim, uh, Carol Bensman are going to show us what to do. Thank you, too. First, they started out, and there's we've got a nice low winter sun, but it's not doing anything for them. Shading, darn, it's not doing anything for their house. The house is still cold. So I'll go up to the roof and pull the tiles off. <coughs> Stack the tiles to one side. Leave an opening for the sun to shine through. Ta-da, you got the sunshine and here we are. Pretty simple, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? So all of you who have overhangs like that, where you don't have a solid surface, even if you have a solid surface, I cut it out and put tiles there, can do this because in March then you send your handyman back up, he puts tiles back up, and you shade it all summer. In the winter, you, in September, you take the tiles down and you've got the heat. It's that simple. Because of the self-facing, everything here could be passive. Let's look at the evolution of our photovoltaic houses, because the history is important. PV house number two in Chapala is Penny White, system by ESA. She put solar water and solar electric. Very courageous for a woman. She came to our house. She said, I want to do it too. PV house number three in Chapala Lakeside, Pete Johansson, PV system by ESA Energy. And he built, he just built right outside. Put it up. This is an amazing house. This is the house for Mr. and Mrs. Alfredo Ventiolio. This is a large system, 24 panels. He really wanted to, he's got a big house, big pool, pool pumps, saunas, you know, the whole bit, not sauna, I mean, not, you know, hot tub. Anyway, he gets a saving of 6,000 pesos per bill. He saves $3,000 a year with that. And he's not afraid to show it. He likes to have it out on his roof where people can see it when you drive up. It's also possible to have it where it's architecture lower. He has a huge system for heating his water. And beautiful interiors. What else do we see in the interiors? Daylighting. Houses designed for daylighting with light colored interiors so you can have all the electric lights off all day and consequently save a lot of energy and reduce the heat from the electric lights in the summer when you don't want the heat to go in the house. So daylighting is an absolute key. Daylight in the summer doesn't mean letting the sun shine. Remember, the sun is shaded. It means letting the shade of daylight come there's a power bar. All right, 2008, four houses. That's good. James and Carrie Hagan system by E2 Energy. It's now we have a second company that's come in. It's come from Guadalajara and has been doing uh, a great deal here as well, roughly in Ecova. So I show examples by both of them. And I believe that there may be tables out on the square by both of those uh, companies for people that follow up questions. I got nothing to do with any of this. 
and it's illegal to you know, have to sell things here. But if they're out in the square and you have questions, stop by. So this is one of their that you can't convert uh, an industrial, a large industrial nation into renewables. We've got the data experience out there. On sunny days, onshore wind and solar photovoltaics PV produce over 85% of Germany's midday power needs. Its wind energy alone is equal to the output of 40 nuclear power plants. If you ever if you came in here doubting that you could do 100% conversion renewables, don't anymore. And because they do so much in Germany, it reduced the cost dramatically. So it costs about half as much to install solar in Germany as it does in the U.S. So now what Germany is doing is as they're heading for 100% renewables, but you don't just do the whole country. It has to go region by region and local by local. And so you find an area, a local area, a rural area, or a local town that said, yes, we have the resources, we're going to convert to 100% renewable, and you begin to get this patchwork quilt where you have uh, 136 regions in Germany, all the green ones, that are committed to going to 100% renewable energy. It represents 26% of the inhabitants of Germany, 21 million people. Here's one example that just happened. This is in Rhein Hunswick, in a district in Germany, and it was 100% fossil fuel powered in 2009. Four years later, they switched, and they're 104% powered by renewable energy, largely wind, photovoltaics, and biomass. It's one of the areas. Each of the areas is so you convert a country not by coming down from the top, but piece by piece by piece, just like they showed us in, in Cameron and Company showed us is the way to convert the Western US, piece by piece by piece. Well, they do it in big cities. Frankfurt is also one of the 100% renewable areas going for it. Almost 700,000 inhabitants. Their target by 2050 is to reduce 95% of CO2 emissions and make 100% of their electricity and heat with renewables. That's in the city of Frankfurt. Well, Greensburg, Kansas, in the U.S., is one of our budding number of communities that have committed to 100% renewables. Greensburg had a reason for doing it. Here's downtown Greensburg before the tornado. There's downtown Greensburg after the tornado. That's what was left, and that's what was left. So they said, we have to rebuild our whole town. Let's do it right and declare themselves to be 100% renewable town. So they used a circumstance to help move them in that direction. But there's also just the fact that if you do it to your neighbor sees it and so on, this is what's happening clearly at Lakeside. So Massachusetts has had a, a, a lot of good incentives for solar. And you see this circle, the little yellow circles there, were the amount of solar applied by people on the roofs of their houses four years ago. And now you see it. So, oh, you've got it on your roof? Gee, I guess I can put it in mine. You've got it on your roof? Oh, well, no, no. I'll show you. I think at the end, it's the same thing. Mexico has an extraordinary renewable energy resource base. It can power a complete energy transition. Also, a duplicate a little bit of some of the slides. It's got from last year. It has more consistent renewable energy density and more favorable countrywide distribution of renewable energy resources than either the United States or Germany. The potential in Mexico for making Electricity and solar energy is enormous, the third largest in the world, and it's everywhere. It's spread over the whole country. Those are very high numbers. The world's largest utility-scale PV system is presently under construction in Mexico. Well, if you want to know how much land it'll take, if, if you could convert and put those same collectors, you just saw the picture of, of that amount of land in Mexico, it'll make enough electricity for the whole country. So it begins to show you the power of the sunshine coming down. The power for making electricity from wind is also very large. The highest wind energy potential in the world is the Oaxaca area because it's in between two different oceans that are at different temperatures. So the wind always blows. Average wind speed of six and a half meters per second or greater is the highest category, category four, you go to five. But that's the highest potential. So what we do is we look at this map and we say, okay, let's think where we can begin to group renewables together. We've got also geothermal, and you notice that the best geothermal potential is Jalisco. And they've got geothermal plants that are out there. Hydroelectric power in Mexico, 22% of the electricity generating capacity is from hydro plants. So Mexico, here you are, looks like the Germany chart. 
Mexico can mix wind and solar intermittent energies with geothermal, hydroelectric, or biomass energies to stabilize the system and provide 100% firm capacity. So here's how we start. You've got solar everywhere. Now we look where the wind is, and so, okay, let's start by identifying areas where you've got a lot of wind along with solar. So here's the wind chart, and this is a better diagram than I do last year. So we start. And we start identifying the regions where we have a lot of solar and a lot of wind, plus additional backup. <laughs> there are your 10 regions. Now, every region has solar plus wind along with at least one of the major supporting backups to level it, hydro or geothermal. So that's how it looks. Wind, solar, biomass, wind, solar, hydro, wind, solar, geothermal, wind, solar, hydro. So we've got 10 zones in Mexico. This is like the Germany plan, but you only have to do 10 here. And transmission interconnection of the regions to transfer the available renewable power to levelize that intermittency. And then uh, you want to have multiple connections to bring in a lot of power to Guadalajara and Mexico City, which you can do. Each zone with wind and solar stabilized by geothermal or hydroelectric or both can operate as an almost independent or self-sufficient region. But connecting them provides the assurance of 100% reliable power for the entire country and for all time. So what have we seen here? Mexico could become almost, if not completely, energy independence using its own renewable resources. Think what that means. All the money for energy would stay in Mexico. It would buy new Mexican energy industries and hundreds of thousands of new jobs. This would be energy prosperity for Mexico. Make Mexico a world leader in the global <coughs> energy transition and the protection of the earth from human-made global warming. So have Mexican politicians and energy planners and decision makers started down this attractive and sustainable path? I said definitely not. I should not have said that because we do have renewable energy policies, there are renewable energy goals. <coughs> so scrap the red letters, but I should say, let's take a look at the actual present energy development plans in Mexico. Here are all of the electric power plants for the country. Here's how we make electricity in Mexico, and I'm going to make it easy for you. There are all the hydroelectric generators. There's the wind generators down in Oaxaca, a couple of solar over here, the one nuclear energy, one that we have off the coast, Veracruz, on the coast, and fossil fuel generators. So that's how we make our electricity in Mexico. All right. They've evolved in Mexico such that over 98% of all of Mexico is covered with electricity. So they've done a good job of providing electricity to people. But they expect in the next 15 years, since it's 2012 now, Mexico will grow from 114 million to 130 million. Cities will go from 384 to 489 cities, and we will go from 72% of Mexicans living in cities and towns up to 88%. So, CFE is responding to it the way CFE expects to. We're going to have more people, more people in cities, we need more power. Here are our plans. These are all authorized for tenure, which means they've been approved. Well, we've got a couple wind projects, we've got a new hydro project. We got a solar energy project, and we got 10 new fossil fuel power plants. And if you remember that chart of mine with all the circles, you'll see that basically they're planning to plop up a new gas fossil fuel power plant inside each of my circles, which are supposed to be 100% renewable. That's not going to cut it. Total new projects, 5.6 gigawatts. Total renewable energy projects, 18.5%. Total fossil fuel project, new projects, 81.5%. Each of these new gas-fired power plants will have a useful life of 30 years. This shows that CFE only knows how to think and plan for a fossil fuel future. And that's sad. Why not this future instead? It's there if the people ask for it, and the government has the leadership to change Mexico's energy course to a sustainable one. Mexican energy policy has to start now to build toward this to wait while building ever more fossil fuel power plants will forever close the door to a renewable energy future in Mexico. Can Mexico afford the cost, though? It's a, it's, it's a developing country, but it's not uh, rich. Well, the cost of PV electricity in Germany right now is 10 euro cents per kilowatt hour. That's solar electricity. And it's less than that in some rich countries. So this is equivalent to making electricity from sun. 
between 9 and 13 pesos per kilowatt hour in Mexico. It costs CFE more than 12 pesos per kilowatt hour to produce electricity with conventional fossil fuel sources. This shows that when the country really undertakes the conversion, the prices come down and you are fully competitive and glad you did it the right way, not the wrong way. The OECD projections to 2035 think that Mexico and Chile will be the most rapidly growing two countries and members of the OECD, 3.7% per year. At the end of 2012, Mexico is forecast to become the eighth largest economy in the world by 2050 based on an estimated GDP growth higher than 4% per year. We're all aware they grew 1% this year. It's not been a good year. They are not on either of those curves. They're having to keep backing down. Uh, it appears to be a blip and an adjustment, and I think these long-range projections are correct. To close out the talk, it's important to note that Mexico's renewable energy transition doesn't have to rely just on very large central renewable energy systems. It can start in one community. I'm repeating a little set of slides I showed last year. Our village, Ahihi, demonstrates that starting with one solar system can lead to a solar energy transition of an entire area. For my wife and I, in 2007, when we moved here, we created the first house and office in the area with solar energy for all electricity and water heating. And we thank Jason Mills for installing the PV for us. And we have our organic garden, which is also very nice. I also shop with the organic Jangus. Well, the number of solar houses in I Hink Lakeside area was our house. The next, the next year, there were three early adopters. Penny White, Mr. Johansson, you're here. I think I saw you. Are you here? Raise your hand if you're here. Nah, I thought it was here. Anyway, and Al Wilson. And they're what we call early adopters. So the following year, 13 people had done it. They're still early adopters. They like solar. They want to do it. They want to do it. But then when 17 houses got up, the residents of the lakeside area started paying attention to the attractive economics of solar energy. And it took off. So in 2011, we had 2,200 street In 2012, we had 350. And I put in, because I don't have a good number, 2013 over 500 so far, I've now been assured, assured that it is now over 600 so far in our area. What has this done for us on a measure of installed solar energy per capita? Ahihik and the Chapala Lakeside area is now the solar capital of the entire country of Mexico. <laughs> and what I'd like to do is have everyone in the audience now, let's see if I have more slides here. Um, I, I, I'm going to stop here and invite you to turn up the house lights. I just have a closing out slide, it doesn't matter. If you're out there, you can turn up the house lights, because I want to be able to see you, and you want to be able to see you. Let's see if that's going to work. It takes a little bit for them to come up. What I want to do is to have all of you who are here, who now have solar converted your houses, to please stand up and be applauded by everyone else. Please stand up. Look at how many. That is amazing, and I'm very proud of all of you. So we close off with a vision of a better and greener Mexico and world for that. Thank you all very much.
And while we're waiting for that, just remember next week, turn your, fa uh, turn your cell phones back on. Next week, Pete Soderman is talking at Open Trump. That's the, uh, the question I'd like to ask is that uh, Pyelbeck Corporation in Korea is now mass producing uh, fuel cell hydrogen vehicles and, and, uh, and changing their, uh, uh, their gasoline fuel uh, infrastructure to uh, include hydrogen fueling stations throughout uh, the country of Korea. Hydrogen is uh, very easily manufactured from uh, uh, DC output from solar power. And I was wondering if there was anything being done in the, uh, in the Mexican environment to replace traffic gasoline transportation fuel from PEMEX to allow people to generate hydrogen at home and, uh, and power their automobiles. The Tucson 2014 from Hyundai is now being imported into Los Angeles and uh, buses in London are being run off fuel cell vehicles. I think it's time that we looked at the uh, transportation fuel question and uh, began to think about converting uh, a heating to, uh, to hydrogen vehicles. Uh, would you please, please uh, be quiet as you're leaving. We're still having a meeting going on, so please refrain from talking until you get outside the door. Please, please, Don's answer. The, the, the question was on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and uh, on whether anything is being done in Mexico on them. There's a little research project being done in UNAP in uh, out of Mexico City, but there's nothing being done uh, on any uh, scale to try to uh, make that change. What they are talking about is shifting from, gas, uh, from oil to gas, because Mexico expects they have a lot of shale gas as well. And you can put the gas directly in the car and burn it. Or you can put it in and make electricity from a fuel cell, and then put the fuel cell in the car and have hydrogen, which is absolutely clean, but meanwhile you sort of disassociated the gas and the carbon dioxide still goes up. So it turns out that the difference in global emissions, whether you make a fuel cell car or whether you burn the gas in your car is about the same. And it's a lot cheaper at this point for them just to consider putting gas in the car. But there's no question, it's got an important area in the future. For buildings, there's a great deal of work being done internationally where you put big fuel cells in buildings because the fuel cell produces heat as well as electricity. If you put it in the building and take the heat to heat the building and take the electricity to power the building, you can get 85% conversion of the natural gas to useful energy. The trouble is when you put it in the car, you throw away all the heat. And all you got left is the electricity. So you're going to find what they call stationary sources are the first ones. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Fuel cell. Hi. Hello? Appreciate appreciated your talk very much. Uh, but uh, he touched on something I was going to ask about. And that's whether, uh, when you have a solar and wind power, you have uh, the power down at times, and you need some kind of backup for it. I was wondering if generating hydrogen is being used by anybody for that backup, as opposed to still using gas, natural gas. Well, it, he, he's just wondering about the backup because the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine. If both happen at the same time, what are you going to do? With your house. I just say that PNI, we have just solar, we don't have wind. We have batteries. We're one of the few houses that has batteries as well. And when the CFE goes out, our house never goes out. So we're doing that. But when I showed on the large scale things, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you've got hydropower and you've got geothermal and so on. You use those to, to fill in. If you're in your own home, and I'm going back to the home, uh, hydrogen generation. People are talking about that as generating, taking the excess electricity that you have. In other words, making a solar system on your roof that's twice as big as you need for your house. And instead of just giving it back to CFE, because CFE won't pay you anything once you go beyond your whole bill, right? You take that extra electricity and you have a hydrogen generator, you make your own hydrogen, and then you have your own backup. And that is something that people are talking about quite a bit, and that is a direction. I expect people to go. But the technology has to come down in cost. Power density of the cells has to come up. But these are good ideas. I'm, I'm 
was thinking of large, of large plants that don't have a renewable backup. Are any of them right now generating hydrogen uh, during peak hours to look after the downtime? No, and I didn't show the picture, and I should have shown a couple of pictures. There's some very large fossil fuel power plants that have got solar related to them. The biggest one is in Daggett, California. It's one third the size of a nuclear plant, 354 megawatts. It has a natural gas generator embedded in the middle. And they, they, they've committed that starting at 7 in the morning, they deliver 354 megawatts to Southern California Edison. Doesn't matter what the sun is doing, you got the backup generator. And then at 7 at night, they're through. And they've found over 28 years of experience that 75% of the electricity came from solar and 25% from natural gas. So it begins to show in those climates that you only need about one quarter of the backup to give it absolutely flat. If you only have one. Now if they put wind into the same uh, transmission grid, it would have been different. And they're not, where the big large scale backup is being done is not with hydrogen. It's you can make electricity from solar thermal generation. You heat the fluid, you have concentrating collectors, you heat the fluid, you make steam, all right? They are going to back up of sodium, liquid sodium in big tanks. And they liquefy the sodium during the day and then make steam at nighttime. So the only serious large utility scale backup going on is liquid sodium, and that's with these large plants. I should have shown a couple pictures. Second question, very short. Um, you uh, didn't say anything about the methane that's trapped in the tundra, and I'm wondering how serious. Is it just minor or, or serious? Well, there's a lot of worry about uh, so-called methane explosion and the methane that's trapped in the tundra, and some of it is leaking out. Um, it turns out for a very, very long time, like possibly 100 years, that's expected to be a rather small fraction of the methane that's already leaking out from our natural gas wells. In fact, they're finding in the fracking operation that they're leaking eight times as much methane. Methane and natural gas are the same thing. Leaking eight times as much methane as anybody ever thought. And so the biggest methane problem right now is to stop leaking it from natural gas. Methane is 27 times more volatile for creating global warming than carbon dioxide. So you've got natural gas, you get the gas out, which produces less CO2 when you burn it. Meanwhile, you let some methane come out of your well, and you've essentially made more of a global warming problem than you would have had otherwise. But the geologic studies that have been out uh, are stating unequivocally that these, these fears of the great methane explosions and everything happening are geologically not feasible, and it'll be a very long time before we begin to see any reasonable amount Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Dominic Vincent. I hope all you guys are able to come next week to the Open Circle.